All right, hello, welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Gold, sales pop, online sales magazine, and pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Amy Lemire Samatos, who is in Chicago today, correct? Yes, good afternoon. Excellent. And Amy helps businesses, entrepreneurs, and sales team improve profits, uh, improve their profits. And she's an inspirational keynote speaker and an author of the Amazon number one best-selling book, From Zero to Sales Hero, How to Double Your Sales and Income in 90 Days. And she's worked with people like Qualcomm, uh, Women's Business Development Center, and a lot of other, Massage MD, there's one of those up the road, you've worked with them as well. Um, so Amy has a lot of experience, so I wanted to talk today about your book. I mean, when you make a claim like how to double your sales and income in 90 days, what's the starting point? So the starting point, John, I call it my AAA formula, and that is three factors. It is number one, attitude, activity and accountability and there's a story behind how i moved my sales from 30 percent of my quota to over 130 percent 90 days but it started out with really evaluating where i was in those three areas and that made all the difference in the world okay so let's talk uh, let's start with the first one attitude because here's one i mean i'm a big believer in this you know but i think that you know people have allowed themselves today they're so they feel like they're overwhelmed they feel like um there's so much being piled on top of them they feel like there are so many external you know factors at play uh and they rarely stop to sort of look at the the common denominator which is themselves and maybe their own attitude so why talk to me a little bit about how you get people to focus on attitude and what power what power there is in that absolutely john i would say that to me attitude is the simplest yet the most difficult for thing things for people to adapt to on a daily basis but i focus on making it simple i call this my daily ritual or my power hour and i coach and i speak to people about the importance of every day whether it's 15 minutes 30 minutes one hour what are you doing your, to get yourself into the performance mindset whether it's meditation, working out, reading something inspirational, and on the moments and the days when I only have 10 minutes, listening to something inspirational in my car, Tony Robbins, Les Brown, Bob Proctor, but something to get me in that performance edge mindset because people buy from whom they like and they trust. And if we come into our meetings and we're not excited and we're not passionate and we don't have high energy, then the person across from us really isn't going to be interested in what we have to talk about or to offer them, speaking from experience. Yeah, uh, no, I, I 100% agree. And I think it's, I think the more people look at what do you fill your mind with, you know, when you start your day off, as you said, if you start your day off with Tony Robbins or something inspiration or meditation, you're getting yourself in the right frame of mind. If you start the day off by looking at social media and getting you know, wound up because it looks like somebody's doing better than you or listening to the news, because let's face it, you're going to find something to make you angry there. Then you're, you're sort of setting, your, you're setting yourself for, up for failure during that day because you're not going into it the best attitude, right? Right, right. Absolutely. That's, um, that's when I wrote my book, my book was actually about a story where one year I was the top performer and the next year I was at the bottom of the sales performance list. And when I assessed and evaluated what I was doing on a daily basis, the number one thing I realized was that I was not taking time to get myself into the mind state and bring the energy forward I needed to bring. So that was the number one shift I made, and that made all the difference in the world. Yeah, and I think that's a great takeaway for people. Um, You know, really look at how you set yourself up every day and what inputs you take into your brain. Uh, You know, psychology today says that about 68% of self-talk every day is negative. So you have to really be thinking about what you're putting into your brain and what your brain is saying to you. Um, And the next part you say is, is activity, right? So get your attitude right. Then talk to me about activity. Yeah, so activity, that was the, the second learning I had the year where, again, I went from zero to sales hero, and I had a sales coach, and he asked me to send him my calendar, and I sent him my calendar, and I thought it was the easy task, but then I looked at my calendar, and I realized my calendar was pretty much blank, except for some meetings and activities that were in no way going to help me make my sales quota 
So it got me to step up and to focus, what do I need to do on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, a quarterly basis to get my sales numbers to where they want to be. So the importance of setting goals, no matter how small or how big those goals are, how many calls am I going to make? How many meetings am I going to have? How many sales am I going to make? How many referrals am I going to get? I would track all that activity on a weekly basis and I would send it to my sales coach. But what it really did is it got me to redevelop the habit of focusing on daily activity. And, you know, as we say, the numbers don't lie. You know, mm -hmm. ad activity equals results. So if we're doing the activity, the results are going to show up. But if we're not doing the activity, we're going to get, um, as we say, a goose egg or a zero when it comes to selling, in my experience. Yeah, and I think there's a, another point to that is, as I said, is um, you looked at everything and sort of said, what activities do I need to execute in order to reach my goal? Uh, if everybody did that, then there's probably a lot of things that, you're do, that people are doing during their day that are not contributing towards that. I mean, I just mentioned social media. You know, maybe you want to stay off social media for the day. Maybe you don't. You don't need to know what's happening with your sports team every hour on the hour, right? Uh, so there are, there's a lot of things that you can do to focus yourself, but I think you're absolutely correct is making sure that you map your activity to your goals. Correct, absolutely. Yeah, and obviously the next piece that comes with that then is accountability, right? Right, right. So one of the things I talk about during the year that I had the tough selling year is that I blamed everything and everybody for my sales results. I blamed the economy, my competition, my customers, the pricing. And what I mean by accountability is the accountability is when we stop placing blame on everything outside of ourselves and we mm -hmm. take a hundred percent responsibility for our numbers, our activity based on what we are doing. And I once had a, a sales VP that said, if you think of your sales territory as your personal business franchise, would you hire yourself as a CEO? If you would, great. If you would not, what is one change you can do today to get yourself to that point of being the successful CEO of your franchise? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic way of looking at it. And I do think, I mean, we call a pipeline, we call salespeople salespreneurs because you are the entrepreneur in the organization and you should manage mm -hmm. your book of business, as you say, like it is your own, your own business. But I like, I like to, uh, the, to focus on accountability for a moment because when you normally mention accountability to people, everybody agrees, yes, there needs to be more accountability. But it's always like, well, they need to be held accountable. They need to be held accountable. But you're correct. It really, it really starts. It really starts with yourself. And uh, and right. there are there are disciplines that you can. I mean, you mentioned how to build the skill of accountability. How do you do that? Sure, that's a great question, John. One of the things that I, I coach and I speak about is I ask myself two questions after every sales opportunity, win or lose, every time I speak or do a training. So the two questions are number one, what went well that I can repeat and do again? And then number two, what did not go well? What would I do different next time? It's actually three questions. But if we get in a habit of asking those types of questions, number one, we're gonna continue to reinforce the good behavior. And number two, we're gonna be constantly looking at ways to get better and to improve our performance. So the other thing I love about those questions is it doesn't give us room to beat ourselves up or sabotage ourselves for something that didn't go right. And on the same token, it's great to celebrate, but if we're just thinking about the last sale we made and, and celebrating that for six to 12 months, <laughs> we have a tendency to forget about what's in front of us. And that's, that's the, the problem I had the year. I had a great sales year and then I had a bad sales year because I was still kind of in that celebration mode and thinking I didn't have to work as hard the next year, which you actually have to work harder once you get successful because the sales environment is always changing. Yeah, I, mean, I think those are, there's a couple of fantastic points in there. Number one is, yes, that's one of the biggest struggles you have with managing sales teams is peaks and valleys of salespeople, and you're correct. And, and it is, when you have a successful year, it's harder to have. I mean, look at when you look at how hard it is to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls or whatever, like they always say, right. it's, it's easier to win one than it is to win the second one, you know, the following year, right? Um, right so those. Yeah, so those are, those are, are really good points. So I think I like that idea of, you know, asking yourselves the questions. And I wonder how many salespeople do that after a sales call or a sales meeting actually go through a, a self kind of a self assessment. 
You know, my experience, John, I think the the rookies or the newer individuals, whether I'm new in sales or I'm a sales professional, I just switched companies. I typically find that people have a very difficult time during that first three to six months because they're in that learning curve mm -hmm. and they're putting out this much effort and they're typically getting that much return on effort. So I think we have a tendency to go into self-sabotage when things aren't going right. So I work with people that are getting started to develop the habit of asking the question. But I think the thing I'll, I find over time is that the more we ask the question, it takes 30 days to build a new habit. The other thing is it is, a way that we can also not allow ourselves to get into a negative emotional back to that attitude issue I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. If we just ask questions of ourselves and we move forward and we learn from every experience. Now there's no such thing as mistakes. There's only learnable moments. So training ourselves into that mindset habit, I think uh, it does take time. It doesn't happen overnight. But I think if we make it a daily habit within 30 days, I, I see people that start getting into that shift of doing it on automatic. Yeah, and, and here's another interesting point because I think you talk about between, behind every sale is a sponsor. So, I mean, talk to me a little bit more about that because that's an interesting component too. Yeah, that's, a, that's something I, I do like to talk about because I think that if you, um, if you, if you look at sales research today, um, I would like to credit, um, there's a great article in the Harvard Business Review called The End of Solution Selling. And Adamson and Dixon, who are the guys that wrote the Challenger mm -hmm. book, one of my all-time favorite sales books, they found that within every account we call on, there's a lot of contacts, but there's only a few contacts that are the ultimate decision makers. So the sponsor, what I mean by that is that if we're dealing with the, the friends or the, or the people that are recommenders, the people at the lower levels of the account, great people, it's not that these are bad people, but they don't have the veto power. They don't have the authority to make organizational decisions. They don't have access to funds and budgeting. It's typically the people up here with either a D, a V, or a C in their title mm -hmm. that have to sponsor the value proposition we're talking about. They don't want to make, they don't want to see us. They don't want to make time for us. So it's a great idea to work with the people at the, um, the middle or the lower level to get them to recommend or sponsor us to the people up at the top of the account. And that's where I had most of my sales success is when I, got to have better conversations with the people that we call the mobilizers. That mm -hmm. um, Those are the ones that, you know, again, they own the problems, they've got the budget, they've got veto power, they are the ones really making the decision. But a lot of us in sales have a fear of picking up the phone and reaching out to them because they, you know, they're, um, they're the big wigs within our account, but they're mm -hmm. the ones who are really making decisions at the end of the day that I found in my, uh, in my 23 years of selling. Yeah, and I think the other thing that uh, some salespeople can fall into the trap of, if you're my first contact and I nurture a great relationship with you, um, number one, it can become a comfort zone, right? So you and I chat all the time. Now, you don't have any, you know, you don't, you're not the final decision maker, but, you know, we can talk all day. You love our solution. And then I, I become a little paralyzed. I'm afraid to to ask you, can I move, can I talk to your boss? Or I'm afraid right. to go outside you because I don't want to destroy our relationship. So we get trapped sometimes in those initial relationships, right? Yes, we do. And it's, it's very common. I went through it many times in my career, but what I typically do in those situations is I will meet with that person. Maybe they're at a lower level and I'll just say, you know, Sue, I've been working with, um, I was in medical sales, by the way, I've been working with hospitals in the state of Illinois for the past 10 years on processes similar to that. I would love to help you save time. I would love to help you save effort. And I want to make you look like a hero in front mm -hmm. of um, the people at this level. What if we sat down with that team as well as you and I help you map out a plan? And with that, I'm going to save you time. I'm going to save you effort. And I'm going to make you look like a hero in front of the um, people within the organization. What would that look like to you? And nine times out of 10, people will say yes to that because they don't want to do extra work. They don't want to spend extra time. They don't want to look like a fool in front of the people up here. They want to look like a hero. So I approach it as a partnership. I don't go around their back. I don't mm -hmm. um, try to, to get meetings with people if they don't want me to, but I really try to involve and engage them so that they feel like they're part of it and I'm not you know, abandoning them during the sales process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And then that helps you to start to move into the trusted advisor role, which is the one that you're, you're aiming for at the end. So talk to me a little bit about right. the trusted advisor role, because we hear a lot about it and people throw it out all the time about, oh, yeah, 
you know, you need to become yeah. a trusted advisor. But I often think that nobody really stops to d define what that really truly means. Sure. So I often give this example when I do my, uh, my sales keynote speeches. And one of the things I say is, you know, we all have consultants. Um, I have a financial planner that's a fiduciary. And I look to this person to make recommendations. I look to them to help me avoid landmines. I look to them to make my life easy, not hard. So if I think about it like that, how would I show up in front of a customer if I'm a trusted advisor? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the, the books I mentioned already, The Challenger Sale, it talks about how today the buyer is getting more sophisticated. They expect us to come and they expect us to tell them about industry insight. They want to know about the trends. They want to know how we can help them. They want to know how we can make their life and their job easier. So if we can uh, take the time out before we go into our sales calls, do the research, find out what the in industry trends are, find out what the competition is doing, find ways we can make their life easier and make their job simple. That's what people want. That's what we all want today. Nobody wants something to be harder. They want it to be easier. So that's really what I think of as the trusted advisor mentality. And I'm not focusing on making a sale. I'm focusing on building a long-term partnership so that you know, we can work together for the next 5, 10, 15 years, and I can come back and talk to you about other products and solutions. But I'm not thinking of this like a one-time sale, and I want to get a sale from the first meeting. Yeah, agreed. And it's interesting what you say there. If you're going to turn up and you're going to um, be able to build this kind of rapport, then you have to understand business and you have to understand the industry you're selling into. You have to understand the business of business and the business of your target buyer. So it does require the salesperson to have more business acumen and more curiosity and interest in what's really going on, as opposed to maybe in the past where you maybe could have got away with not really knowing that much about business, but just being able to sell mm -hmm. the product. Right. Absolutely. And that's the, the interesting piece of it is if you think about it, John, information is everywhere, whether it's mm -hmm. on your, you know, your, your smartphone or the internet or the competition. Our customers, by the time they contact us, you've probably heard the statistic, they're 57% of the way through their sales process. So if they're getting their information from other places, the risk we run is that they're make, they've already made judgments about us, our prices, what we offer. It's up to us to be, again, that trusted advisor and to come to them fully aware of what's going on because they've already been doing their homework, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And if we come in there and we don't know anything, they're going to look at us like, I hate to say it, almost like we're an idiot. Like, <laughs> why are you wasting my time? You know, what, what, you know, that, that, that they're more sophisticated. So we as sales professionals, we've got to take our game from here up to here today and selling what we sold yesterday or last year really isn't going to work anymore. Yeah. And I think there's another point to that as well is that, because buyers are so bombarded with information, they do all the research, uh, a lot of the times now they become so overwhelmed that they actually stop and they end up not right. making any decision. So to your point, if you can come and show how you can make life easy for them and make it easy for them to make a decision and make their, you know, their job easier, solve the problem, then you're a godsend. That's right. That's right. And, you know, it's interesting, John, you probably have heard the other statistic is that most sales processes, um, the biggest competitor, it's not the competition, mm -hmm. it's inaction. Yep. It's that, um, you know, the, the purchasing group sizes, the people involved now, it's on average about, you know, 5.4 people. Mm -hmm. But trying to get 5.4 people to make a decision, if they can't agree, they just say, forget it, we'll put this off for six months, and we're just going to do it next year. And if you think about it, I mean, think about your friends or your family even agreeing on where we're going to go on vacation or go out <laughs> to dinner. You get that many people together and it's hard to make a decision. So we need to guide them down the pathway so that they don't get to inaction. We need to inspire them and be that trusted advisor so that they would never think something of, let's put this off. They're clear because we're clear about how we're going to help them get from point A to point B. Yeah. And the other part of that is like going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of sponsors and that, and that is understanding the roles that each of these people play in the buying process because they all play different roles, right? So you have to understand Absolutely. what those roles and tailor your message uh, accordingly. Uh, well, listen, right. uh, Amy, before we uh, finish up here, I just wanted you to, again, just remind people of your book from Zero to Sales Hero. I think you've got a copy in front of you there. You just... Yeah, sure. So um, here's my book, From Zero to Sales Hero, How to Double Your Sales and Income in 90 Days. And John, the book is available on Amazon. And I wrote this book, really, I, what I put in the book is my 
10 secrets of how I went from 30% to 130% of my sales quota in 90 days. But really, um, most importantly, it's the 23 years of selling and what I did to continue to help me be a top performer that I put in this book. It's a quick read. Uh, I know salespeople don't like to sit down and read books. I sure didn't. So I made it quick, simple, easy to read. And that's, um, that's where people can go to get my book. Excellent. And where can they go to find out more about you and your services? Sure. That's a great question. So they can go to uh, www.aimwithamy.com. That's my website. Or if somebody wants to reach out um, on email, amy at aimwithamy.com. Last but not least, phone number, if you'd like to drop me a line, 847-868-2469. And that way, um, if someone wants to set up a one-on-one -on -one or coach or consult or talk to me about something different, I could do that on a phone. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, listen, Amy, this has been uh, this has been fascinating. Again, the book is from zero to sales hero. Uh, my name is John Gold from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeline CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Okay, thank you, John, for having me on your show today. I enjoyed it, and I hope everybody out there has a great, successful sales day. Perfect. Thank you.